What's going on gamers? What's up world? Austin John Plays here and today we're going to be going over the history of Link's Awakening making its way from the Game Boy to the Nintendo Switch. The year is 1986 and we got Zelda 1 or as it was called at the time Amazing revolutionary game at the time that there was a complete open world that allowed you to explore however you wanted. Opposed to its much more linear Mario Bros game, this game took a completely different approach and people loved it. A year later in 1987, Zelda 2 was released. And it was... It was Zelda 2. Then, 1990, we got the Super Nintendo, often referred to as the SNES. I'm probably going to say SNES, so don't get mad at me. And a year later, A Link to the Past. It had the same top-down style as Zelda 1, but with a greatly updated UI art style, and Link no longer had orange eyes and lips. A Link to the Past introduced several new ideas that would become staples in the Zelda world, like the Master Sword and Spin Attacks. Then, there was a new project that started just for fun, by several employees at Nintendo. They started working on an unofficial Zelda game for the Game Boy with an extra development kit. This was a passion project, and it was pitched to the higher-ups at Nintendo, and they got approval for bringing our green tunic-wearing fairy boy to the warm green glow in your hands of the Game Boy. This would also be the only game up until that point that series creator Shigeru Miyamoto wasn't overseeing or working on. And you know what happens when the boss isn't over your shoulder and you work on something you love, you get a little crazy with it. This game was visioned as a project that would steer Link away from series norms like Hyrule, Zelda, Ganon, and the Triforce. This game featured a story that was more detailed than a previous one of run around and collect things and save a princess, to a story that picks up after a Link to the Past and sets Link off on his ship when he encounters a large storm. He gets knocked down and washed ashore to Koholan Island. A wise owl speaks to him there and tells him that there's only one way home, and that's to wake the windfish. The windfish is in a giant egg at the top of a mountain, and Link needs to travel the world and collect eight musical instruments to wake him up. How one person is gonna play eight musical instruments to wake a giant fish who's super lazy and is sleeping inside of an egg? I don't know, it sounds something like a dream. I don't know, maybe this is foreshadowing. While the world and items that you're collecting is different in this game as opposed to previous games, it still somewhat mirrors how in Zelda 1 you have to travel to many different parts of the same world and collect many pieces of your full ultimate goal, whether that be a Triforce or a small orchestra. But the similarities are far outweighed by the differences in this game. Link's Awakening introduces fishing, a staple in Zelda games. There's a long trading sequence in game that I'm sure all of us can appreciate in future games. There's a way to combine items like bombs and arrows, spoilers, to make bomb arrows. And there's even a short side-scrolling 2D platforming section in this game. This team really had some far out there ideas. But that team let their imagination run wild and also brought several Mario characters into the game in the form of Easter eggs, enemies, and allies, such as Chain Chomps, Goombas, Shy Guys, Luigi, Yoshi, Piranha Plants, the boss from Doki Doki Super Mario 2 Panic, and even Kirby shows up. All of these new crazy elements made a Zelda game that was very different from the previous three entries. Eventually, Shigeru Miyamoto joined on as a game tester and gave his input on the project, which I can only imagine he was like, what the hell did you guys make? But you know what? This kind of works. Finally, the game would release in 1993 for the handheld console, and it was met with worldwide appraise. This was seen as one of the defining games on the Game Boy for being a full, drawn-out world, packed to the two-megabyte brim with memorable characters, places, and secrets to explore. This is kind of a great story. I touched on the details very lightly, but it's kind of like a 90s movie with a bunch of B-team people who had a great vision that was unorthodox and the mainstream idea for a product, but there was so much passion put into it that in the end, it ended up becoming amazing and loved by everyone because it was super awesome because they put their heart into it. The idea of thinking outside the box on this title will go to influence Zelda games going forward for better. N not for worse, only for better. And even Ajio Numu was quoted with saying, If we had proceeded from A Link to the Past straight to Ocarina of Time without Link's Awakening in between, Ocarina would have been different. I think it's belovedly strange how this is the first game that broke all the Zelda rules and loved by many. Much like one of my favorite Zelda games of all time, Majora's Mask, which was developed in about a year, reused many of the same elements as Ocarina of Time, but the story and its direction was so far different from what we had seen up until that point that it stands out a lot in my mind 
when looking at all of Link's grand adventures. Five years after the release of Link's Awakening, the Game Boy Color was released holiday 1998. Less than two months after the release of the Game Boy itself, Link's Awakening was ported and re-released in color as Link's Awakening DX, which includes a new secret dungeon called the Color Dungeon. Creative naming, I know. Up until that point, it was just referred to as the Green Dungeon. 26 years after its original release, in February 2019, the Nintendo Direct that started off by showcasing slopes in Mario Maker 2 ended with a reveal trailer that no one was expecting, Link's Awakening for the Switch, with the release date of September 20th, 2019. If this is going to be the second Zelda game you're playing, and the only other game you've played so far is Breath of the Wild, well, you're in for quite a difference. It's going to be very different and uh, slightly more linear than what you're expecting, but I'm going to be making a lot of videos on the game for beginners and people who have played the original many times over, covering getting stuck in certain areas, as well as all the great secrets and strategies that this game holds. And if you don't own a Nintendo Switch yet or Link's Awakening, we're giving away a Switch Lite and a copy of Link's Awakening. Between when this video goes live, you're watching it right now, and the release of the game, all you need to do is subscribe to the channel, like this video, and leave a comment down below. The comment has to have the word Link in it. Now you could just write Link, or you can make it fun, like when I was younger I was being chased by a dog and then I had to climb over a chain Link fence. See what I did there? Because if everyone just writes Link, they're gonna think it's spam, but if you make it a fun story, that's the key. That's the key to, to beating beating the, the YT boss. I'm gonna be announcing the winner on Twitter, so be sure to follow me at Austin John Plays on there. I'm going to be announcing it on release day. We're gonna be mailing them a Nintendo Switch Lite and a copy of Link's Awakening worldwide. The deep detailed story of how Link's Awakening came to be is a really beautiful one. And if you want to learn more about it, I recommend checking out the Gaming Historian's fantastic video on the story of Zelda Link's Awakening, which was used for some of the reference material for this video. Well guys, I'm going to be wrapping this up. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like down below. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe, turn on notifications. If you like Link or Legend of Zelda, subscribe to the channel and turn on the bell. Great, because we're doing that a lot. Until next time, Austin John out.